Hi, I'm Paul Merriman, and I'm a retired investment advisor. I retired in 2012, sold my investment advisory firm, and devoted my retirement to giving financial education to people of all ages, high school kids, university students, retired people. All of the work of my financial education foundation is about helping people make more on their investments. I find typically that what people are looking for, particularly young people, is some way to retire early. And I think this information can help. I also find that people want to retire at the normal age, 65, 70, and have more money to spend. I think this information will help. And a lot of us not only want to enjoy our money in retirement, but we'd like to leave a legacy again. That is the focus of the work that I do. And today, I want to focus on the target date fund. What I consider to be the number one retirement investment, and maybe, just maybe, the best investment most people will ever make. I want to talk briefly about three different uh, products, investment products, that I would say are the three best ever invented. The first one would be mutual funds. We all know what a mutual fund is. And then the second one would be a, an index fund. That was a major, major change. And then finally, finally, the cream of the crop becomes, I think, the target date fund. So let's talk about the first of these three great products. In 1924, Massachusetts Investors Trust created and introduced the first mutual fund. And that mutual fund gave investors something they never had before. They gave particularly smaller investors, I'm not talking about their height, I'm talking about the size of their pocketbook, the ability to invest in a broadly diversified portfolio like the wealth they could get through some trust in a bank. And they gave them the ability to have diversification amongst many stocks, professionally chosen rather than having a phone call from a stockbroker with a great pick. And they had this, this, as I say, the low minimum and one day liquidity. This is one of the beautiful things about, about mutual funds. Unlike a lot of other investments that give good long-term returns, they're not easy to get out of once you get in them. But mutual funds, one day. And that was, an, that was a big deal. Now, that liquidity can hurt people too because that makes it too easy for them to, to fire the fund and take their money back because they're afraid of the market. Well, we're going to be addressing that fear in just a few minutes. And today, what do we have? We have these great big mutual fund families with, with, with mutual funds specializing in large companies and small companies and growth and value and U.S. international REITs, emerging markets, tax-exempt bonds, taxable bonds, high-yield bonds. I mean, it goes on and on. And if that's not enough, there are places you can go where they have mutual fund marketplaces, where you can get access to many different fund families under one umbrella. Pretty amazing what has happened since 1924. All right, let's go to the second great uh, invention, if you will, a product that, that, that I think had a huge and continues to have a huge impact on investors, and that's the index fund. 1976, John Bogle comes out with what was called Bogle's Folly. It was a almost a complete failure. I mean, literally, almost did not become a product because they expected to raise about $150 million. Instead, they raised $11 million. And literally, the trustees were thinking about simply giving the money back because obviously there was no use for this particular product. Well, we know with time, the public started to understand that not did you get just diversification, you got massive diversification, 
And you got it at a very, very low cost. Since then, the academics have done the studies, and the academics have determined that of all the variables that lead to better rates of return, it's low expenses. So the index did that. And today, literally, literally, you not only can get index funds with low fees, you can get them with no fees. No commission to buy, no commission to sell, and literally no operational expenses being charged to the investors. What a change. When I think back to 1966, when I came into this industry and load funds were charging 8.5% and there were no index funds. You know, in some ways, things have never been better. And the thing that a lot of us like about the index fund is they are more tax efficient and they give higher expected returns. What more could we want? Now, let me talk about those returns. I've given you a page of information here about a study by a Dr. Bessembinder. He did a study looking at every public company since 1926 recorded their annual returns, recorded their annual dividends, so you could see all of the money that those companies made. Now, you're going to find this hard to believe, but this is what they say happened when they looked at all those numbers. One out of 25 companies made enough money to have a real impact on the, on the return of stocks, less than 4%. If you looked at the other 96%, the average return was virtually the same as treasury bills. You could have had the same return without taking any risk. But if you were able to buy the whole market, which we are today through index funds, you would have gotten the 10% compound rate of return. So the academics tell us today, if you want to be assured of getting the great return that the market has given. Of course, we don't know what the future will bring. That's completely unknown. But we do have 90 plus years of evidence of how the market has done through depressions and wars and inflation and deflation, et cetera. It looks like that 9, 10% return is what we, I guess, could expect over a very long period of time. So. The index fund gives you access to all of the companies so you are likely to make that return. If you try to find the manager who's going to pick the 4%, they'll all try. They'll all try. But the odds are, and I'll show you this in just a few minutes, that they will in fact fail. So now we come to target date funds. Why do I think they're the best investment product of all time. Well, let me talk about the kinds of people that need help. There are a lot of people who, who, who study the stock market, who study the mutual fund industry. They're, they're, they're real students. They know about the levels of losses during the bad times. They, 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 they know how difficult it is to predict the future and all the things that have to do with successful investing for the long term. But most people don't have a clue. And even some of those people who think they're experts don't have a clue if you listen to them for a while. So here's what I like about a target date fund. For the average person starting an IRA, starting a 401k, the target date fund asks one thing, one thing only. What year do you think you're going to retire? I know the 20-year-old uh, first-time worker, he doesn't know when he's going to retire, but he's got to think. Do you want to work till you're 65? Do you want to work till you're 60? You'd be surprised how many young people at the, at the university level only want to work till they're 50. But they have some intuitive sense. And once you have some intuitive sense of when you're likely to retire, you can buy the mutual fund, the target date fund, that is built to take care of your money for the rest, in fact, the rest of your life. Not just to retirement, but through retirement until the day you die. And taking care of 
professionally. They, by the way, they do it in five-year increments. So there's a 2015 and a 2020 and a 2025, all the way out to 2065. We even have a, have a portfolio that we've concocted that goes out to 2085. Why? For a newborn child. Why not get them started with a target date strategy from the time they're born? All right. The target date fund has all the advantages of the mutual fund. Professional stock picking, low minimums, all the things we would look for uh, in, in, a, in a good investment in a mutual fund, but they take it one step further. And that step is that they also professionally manage the asset allocation, the balance between stocks and bonds. And in doing that, they are addressing in the early years the reality that young people should have a lot of equities, if not all equities, which a lot of young people don't want to do. 30% of millennials believe that cash is the right place to have investments that you want to count on over 10 years. I mean, that is a disaster waiting to happen for most people. So that professional inside of a target date fund is going to expose you to this diversified portfolio, probably all equity or 90% equity. And then as you get older, they start moving to fixed income. Now here's something you got to understand about Target date funds, they're just like other mutual funds. It's easy for the manager to have their idea or the team or the committee as to what the glide path should be for the rest of your life. What's the glide path? The glide path is okay at, at, at 20 and 25 and 30, maybe you're going to be mostly or all in equities and then when you're 40 you start getting more money in bonds. In fact, you can see that here on this slide. I got two I got two major target date funds here for you to look at. One is the Vanguard target date 2060. The other is BlackRock. BlackRock doesn't have any fixed income for, for the first uh, years in, the, in their portfolio. Vanguard does. I would prefer myself BlackRock over Vanguard for that. Notice how in the, in the, the very later years of their life, BlackRock has about 40% in equity, while, while the people at, uh, uh, at, at Vanguard have much less in, about 15%, I'm sorry, 25% uh, in equity. Well, I'd probably favor 25% uh, in, in, in the latter years of one's life because built into a portfolio that's got 40% uh, uh, equity is a loss of about 20 to 25 percent of the value of your portfolio. Too much for most people. So you should know about the glide path and where you find that glide path is at the bottom of the portfolio page on Morningstar free service. Look at the portfolio page and down at the bottom you'll see the glide path of every target date fund. So why do I consider the target date fund the investor's best friend. Well, first of all, let me tell you about what my experience is with investors. When I was an investment advisor, I dealt with a lot of retired people. And when I did workshops for the public, I spoke to a lot of retired people. And the greatest security they felt in their life came from the, getting a pension payout every month. They never had to worry about whether the stock was going up or down the stock market, they only had to think that, you know, is the company still solvent or they ever, wherever that money is, maybe with an insurance company, are they solvent and able to pay me that monthly uh, income that I get from the pension fund. Now, we all know that there are very few pension funds left, but when they were there, people loved them. And here's what happened. The company, the corporation, said, hey, we could pay these people more money, but let's create a benefit where they stay with the company and we're going to take part of what they would have otherwise could have, we could have paid them, and we're going to put that into a pool where it will be professionally managed so that when they get to retirement, they'll have, there'll be money there to, in essence, create the cash flow they need for their pension. Now, what I think is interesting here is that that's the way it was 
the, the employee didn't have any choice about the money going into that pool. The employee didn't have any choice about how the money was going to be invested. They only had the hope, the hope, that when the time came, the company would be able to meet their obligation. The target date fund is as close as we get to the pension. Because in the target date fund, you have to make the commitment. Now, the company may match, the company may match the early dollars, but you have to put in some to get that. And you have to put in more if you're going to get where you're trying to go in terms of retirement. And you are going to have to have somebody, if not you, decide how to invest it. And that's what the target date fund does. It does, in essence, what the trustees used to do. At, uh, in, in the pension, or still do for some. And the beauty is, you stay out of all of the emotional challenges that you might put yourself into as an investor. Chasing performance, uh, being scared out of the market, being afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh my God, do you know who just got elected president? I mean, it's almost like every president I've ever known. I, I used to have a client, somebody would call and say, get me out of the market. I don't want to be in the market as long as Clinton's president, as long as Obama's president. I mean, there are emotions we have about what we trust and what we don't trust. And you don't get into those with a target date fund. And on top of that, you don't chase fads. You're not likely to time the market. What does everybody say about timing? Oh, you shouldn't do that. You'll make less money if you try to time the market. If you try to time the market, you're likely to get out of the market in, uh, uh, in, in 2008 or, or, or early in 2009. And a lot of people did. Still sitting on the sideline trying to figure out when to get back in. They may not realize it, but they probably just cost themselves a million dollars in many cases because they did market timing. And one of the things that is actually good, not bad, investors like to be part of the herd. They really do. I, I, I know when I was in, in the industry and you'd have a big decline, as long as everybody went down together, most people were okay. If they didn't go up with the market and instead they were someplace where they didn't get a chance to make money, they were mad as hell. But they didn't mind it as long as kind of everybody was struggling together. And this, there is no bigger herd of investors than with target date funds. And I really do believe you're going to get much higher rates of return with the target date fund. But they got problems. They got things I don't like about them. They have, they have things that I believe truly are going to cost investors a lot of money. Do you know that if a person put $5,000 away for 40 years each year, $200,000, if they got an 8% compound rate of return, and uh, then they retired and they got a lower rate of return, let's say 6 and they took out 4% a year, they would take out a certain amount of money and have money left over to others. But if, if they could raise that return from 8 to 8.5 eight during the years that the, that, that the market is, they're putting money at risk, and then make 6.5 instead of 6 when they're in retirement, the difference in what they will have over their lifetime, what they will spend and what they'll leave to others, is almost $2 million. That's what I don't like about target date funds. They do things to investors that I think do cost a half a percent. In fact, I think that they likely cost them 1%. Now, I want to talk about those, then I'm going to tell you what I think we should do about it. First of all, I've already brought up the point about bonds, that having bonds in the portfolio early, that's costing people money in terms of return, that should be taking the risk of an all-equity portfolio when they're in their 20s and their 30s. 10% in bonds over time reduces the return of the portfolio by one half of 
So there it is, right there, for the first 20 years. You got 10% in bonds when you shouldn't have 10% in bonds because you're young and you should be willing to take that risk. It's costing you that magic one half of 1%. But let me show you bonds. Let me show you how poorly bonds produce. Now I'm thinking about these 30% of millennials saying cash is where you should be. This particular chart goes back to 1928. From 1928 to 2018, it looks at short-term bonds, intermediate-term bonds, and long-term bonds, all governments. And what do we see? We see the compound rate of return of T-bills, short-term, is about 3.3%. And a $100 investment in, 19, in, in, in 1928 over the 91 years would have grown to about 2,000. Go to the long-term bond. Instead of 3.3, it's 5.4. It is more volatile than the short-term bond, more risky on a short-term basis. But look, it grew, that $100, to $12,000. Now, that, that's a big difference. But what if? What if we had your money instead of in bonds, we had it in stocks? How would you have done? Well, over that 91-year period, the S&P 500, that what they call large cap blend, that asset class compounded at 9.7. If you were in small cap value, the riskiest of these four asset classes, the compound rate of return was 13.1. What happened to $100? Did it grow to be worth, what did I say, about uh, uh, $2,000 or $12,000? No, it grew to be worth, in the case of the S&P 500, over 450000 and in the case of small cap value, over $7 million. Now, I'm not in the business anymore. All I am is a teacher. That's it. I love teaching. I think I may do more good work in my retirement just teaching than managing money for people because there are so many people that need to see this information. So when young people say that they think that they're better off in the long term in bonds or cash than they are in equities, well, let's look at the 40-year at the return of the, uh, the equities. The 40-year return, the average 40-year return was about 10.9% for large cap blend, the S&P 500, and was over 16. This was the average 40-year return. You can see the worst and the best compound rates of return from 1928 to 2018. And anybody who could conclude that for the long term, it is safer to be in fixed income than it is in equity, don't understand the impact of inflation because inflation would take most of the money that you would have made in those bonds. I'm not saying bonds are bad. Bonds are good at the right time. When it is time to get defensive, and that is in the latter years of your, of your, of your working period, when you start getting closer and closer to retirement, you need to have what I guess we would consider to be uh, more confidence. You can't be taking high risk when you're 55 and 60. Also, the target date funds uh, are not particularly good for taxable accounts. Now, that's not a big deal because for a lot of people because most of their investments are going to be in IRAs or, or 401ks. But here's a killer. And remember I talked about that half a percent and that one half a percent, or the one percent, one half a percent, and what that does over a lifetime to you? Well, there are actively managed portfolios in the target date fund universe. And guess what they're charging? In many cases, they're charging over one percent a year for active management. Now, by the way, if those active managers could be counted on to make more than the indexes, starting at 1% more approximately, because you can get the index-based 
target date funds for one-tenth of one percent or fifteen one-hundredths of one percent versus more than one percent? If those active managers could be counted on doing better, absolutely would be worth it. But there is no evidence. In fact, the evidence is just the opposite. The evidence is, according to the Standard & Poor's uh, semi-annual report, they do this twice a year, every six months, they look at every mutual fund in the U.S. By the way, they do it internationally, too. If you just, if you just uh, do a search for SPIVA, S-P-I-V-A report, you'll be able to find the huge pages and pages and pages of information that would make you believe active management is not in your best interest. But here's a bottom line number we know. We know that if we look at all of the large cap U.S. funds and we look at one year of performance, this was as of mid-year 2018, we look at one year's performance, we see that about 37% of the funds, actively managed funds, were able to do better than the index itself. Most funds, even at the one-year time frame, in fact, in the case of small caps, it's even, it's even worse because 73% were not able to beat the index, but when we get out to 15 years, and we're talking about 15 years, we're talking about 40 years in many cases. When we look out 15 years, the research shows, and this is not somebody who's trying to sell indexes or trying to sell active management. They're just trying to report the facts. But when you go out 15 years, in the case of small cap, a little more than 2% of the managers are able to beat the index itself. Mid caps, not quite 5%. Large caps, not quite 8%, are able to beat. Less than 1 out of 10 in each case. So if you had to place a bet, if you were going to Vegas and you were going to place a bet on active management, or passive indexing, what do you think would be the smart thing to do? Now, I don't know what odds they'd be putting on it, because if you happen to pick one, the active manager who did better than the index, then maybe you get a big payoff because it's so uncommon. But the odds are, if what you're talking about is your own personal bottom line, how much money do I have at retirement? How much money can I take out of that money in retirement? How much am I going to leave to others? If you want the probabilities on your side, you know where you're going to get them. And that is in the index approach. And not only that, but an index approach within the target date fund. Other problems. You know something, the target date fund doesn't know what else is going on in your life. They don't know if you just won the lottery, or your parents just died and left you billions. They don't know this kind of stuff. So it just assumes that in essence you're one of the masses. Now there's nothing wrong with being one of the masses when you're being taken care of, but the, but the target date fund does not take that into consideration. And if I had my way, I'd have three levels of risk at Vanguard. I'm a big Vanguard fan. I would have three levels of risk in the target date fund. I'd want to have a level that would, 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 would really respond to those 30% of millennials that are scared to death of anything but cash. I'd say, okay, give them a conservative strategy, something they're more likely to stay the course with. Have a moderate level and have an aggressive level for the people who understand, but they don't want to have to fool with it themselves. They want somebody else to do it. It's not a sin to have somebody else manage your money. I know a lot about investing. I have someone who manages my money and my wife's. Not because I don't know how to do it, but it's not what I want to do with my life. I'd rather be here teaching by far. So. 
Uh, it is my sense that we need multiple levels. And also target date funds uh, have the same exposure, the same exposure to equities at all different levels, uh, age levels. How can that be? How could a 91-year-old at Vanguard have the same? Now, now, they have less in equities than a 21-year-old. That part is true. But the equities they do have at 91 are the same equities as they do have at 21. That's not right. There's too much evidence. Not a, not a sales pitch. There's 90 years worth of documented evidence that some asset classes do better than others. Yes, the S&P 500 is a wonderful asset class. But there's mid cap, there's small cap, there's value. And so I would want a young investor to have a more diversified portfolio that, by the way, when you mix them together, this is the beauty, when you mix a portfolio of some big and some small and value and growth and U.S. and international and REITs and emerging markets, turns out, I've written about this, the ultimate buy and hold strategy is about that. It turns out the risk is virtually the same as the risk for the S&P 500, but the return is higher. And then the biggest crime of all, from what I know about the past, is they don't have much in value and small. And value and small have been big winners. Just ask Warren Buffett about large cap value made him a very, very wealthy man. Now what he tells people to do with their own money is put it in the S&P 500. I just want to grab them by the neck. Not that the S&P 500 is bad, it's just that you would think he would teach that maybe some of their money should be invested kind of like he did. So what can we do to overcome the weaknesses of the target date funds? Well here quickly are some suggestions. One is if there's too much in bonds, you could build your own target date fund. Remember the first 20 years at Vanguard is basically in the equity portion, 70% U.S. Uh, total market and 30% uh, total international market. You could just buy those two funds, put them together, 70-30, but take the bonds out. It wouldn't be a target date fund, but at age 40, when they start adding more fixed income to the portfolio and you didn't want to do it, you would then simply convert your total market U.S. and total market international into a target date fund at age 40 and let them start adding the fixed income. Not inappropriate. Too much in bonds? Well, you could buy a target date fund and then buy a second fund and the second fund equity fund added to the target date fund would reduce the overall percentage of bonds. That would have a positive impact. Too little in small cap. Well, what you could do is you could buy the target date fund and you could put a small cap fund with it. Call it two funds now instead of one. But easy to do. It'd take you 10 minutes a year to do this. And you would simply put some small cap with the larger cap that's in the target date fund. Too little value, same thing. All you have to do is add a value fund to the portfolio. Now, it starts to get better. I mean, it turns out that you could actually add small cap value to the portfolio. When you add small cap value as your second fund, you are picking up small, that has a history of a premium, and you're picking up value. It's interesting because large cap and small cap value tend to go up and down together. Not always, not always, but most of the time. But the small cap value goes up more, aha, this won't be a surprise, and down more. The large cap value doesn't go up as much and doesn't go down as much. So depending on your aggressiveness, you could determine, in fact, in fact, we, we show performance of, of, of having three funds, having the target date fund, and then also some small cap and some large cap value. Now there are other things you can do. 
Other things you can do is go to your trustees and say, please, we think it's great that some company has sold you the idea that their target date fund is going to be better because you pick better stocks than an index can pick. Because an index fund, they'll say, owns all the bad ones too. Who wants to know they're going to own all the bad ones? Well, folks, that's the way an index fund works. But it's a great sales pitch to fight it. But you want to do something right for the employees? Simple, 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 simple. Just add a lineup of index base. I don't care if it's Vanguard or BlackRock or Fidelity. Add a lineup so that those of us who believe that indexes are going to give us maybe 1% more per year, and we've worked hard, this is our money, and we appreciate the match that you've, that you've given, and if you really want to hold our feet to the fire, then you can say you can only put the match in the more expensive, actively managed. And I don't think you're going to say that, are you? Because you're going to see what is probably in the best interest. And at some point, you're going to realize you were probably sold a bill of goods when you ended up with those actively managed target date funds. And I believe the same thing about just index funds in general. I see a lot of 401k plans. Uh, in fact, we, my, my, my foundation analyzes 401k plans. Don't get paid a penny for it. None of the work that we do do we get paid anything. It's all about trying to get good information to people. And we see more and more index funds popping up in 401k plans. We're also seeing more and more value funds popping up in these, por in these uh, portfolios. Chris Pedersen is not only one of the nicest people I've ever met, but Chris Pedersen is one of the smartest people that I've met, where I'm in a position to kind of judge that level of intelligence. And we were talking about all the problems with target date funds because they don't have the right exposure to some asset classes that we think are just natural, just natural to have in the portfolio. Chris came up with an approach and a study. Uh, I, I, it, it, it just was so simple and so obviously right. Now, by the way, the only right will be what happens that we don't know today. So, so I can feel very strongly about something that's being done and be wrong. And that's the nature of the investment industry. But we were talking about, could we make it so simple as having just two funds? There are a lot of people who love the idea of finding two funds. For retirees, many times I've talked about combining Vanguard, Wellington, and Wellesley. Two funds. And it's not unusual to be able to find two funds that can do most of what you need to be done during different parts of your life. But here's what Chris developed. First of all, he said, what if we took a, a target date fund and just put 10% in small cap value? No rebalancing, two investments for life in essence. One's the target date, the other 10% is small cap value. Is that going to threaten your existence, do you think, to have 10% in small cap value? I think not. Then he also looked at having 20% in small cap value. Obviously, we would expect the returns to be higher by having 20% rather than 10%, and you'll see in a second that they were, were. Not will be necessarily, but were. But then he came up with, with, with something, because there's a problem. If you put 10% or 20% of small cap value in the portfolio, you run the risk that the smart, small cap value does so well that it becomes a major part of your portfolio when you're 65. Not a good idea because it's a higher risk asset class. So Chris came up with this simple answer. It's a formula, not patented, not copyrighted. 
just a great idea for people who would, in fact, like to figure out how to add small cap value to their portfolio and still not have to kind of do anything, just put it on automatic. Well, it's going to take you five or ten minutes a year to do this. But you devote your target date fund money to two funds. The formula is you take 1.5 times your age and that's what goes into the target date fund. The balance goes into either small cap value or large cap value or small cap blend or a combination of small cap value and large cap value. So if you're 20, you multiply that, multiply that by 1.5, and there you go. You got 30, 30% 30 into the target date fund, and 70% into small cap value. By the time you're 40, it's 60% in the, in the target date fund, and 40% in small cap value. By the time you're 66, it's 100% in the target date fund, and the small cap value is gone. Here's some numbers. And we always struggle with what to say about numbers when we look back. I can tell you that Chris has turned the numbers inside out. Looking at Monte Carlo studies and, and, and different ways to judge the risk, to judge the return. And from 1970 through 2017, and by the way, he's done this study going all the way back to 1926. And you'll be able to see that if you go to twofundsforlife.com. And I really do encourage you to read his article. You know, this is all about do-it-yourself. This is not something that, that we have any involvement in except to help you do better if we can. But I want you to see these returns. The Vanguard like TDF, target date fund. How can you, how can you create a Vanguard-like going back to 1970? There was no Vanguard target date fund until 2004. So what you do is you take their glide path. And the asset classes have been around. You can see how the asset classes have done using the glide path that, 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 that Vanguard creates and shows you right there on their page in Morningstar. So what did Chris find? He found that if you put away $10,000 a year, and in order to kind of make up for whatever raise you might have gotten or, or the, the, the inflation, he adjusts that amount each year for inflation to make it more real, make it in today's dollars, I guess you could say. It was about 800 and some thousand dollars invested but the target, the Vanguard-like target date fund grew to be worth almost $8 million. If you put 10% in small cap value, 90% in the target date fund, it was $10.3 million. Not only does that change how much you take, this, by the way, is at age 65 in theory, 40 years of doing this. Actually, it, uh, these are 40-year periods from 1970 through 2017, so you have more than one. But when you put in 20%, it turns out to be 12.6 or $7 million. More to spend, more to leave. And then you'll see on the table here that it shows the returns of the 1.5 times your age using large cap value 1.5 times your age, using small cap 1.5 times your age, using small cap value. And those returns, by the way, which are much less risky, much less risky, uh, are still significantly above what you would have gotten had you been just in a target date fund. Look, many of you... As this, as this video was made for professionals, CPAs and some others, 
You have an impact on other people in a number of ways. I happen to know with CPAs that they are probably the most trusted individual within the world of money. Partly because we expose everything to you about ourselves, including all the mistakes we make. Nobody knows more about us than, than our CPA. But I do think there's an area here where you can have an impact on a trustee with a 401k plan. You'll probably know that they are a trustee with the company. It could very likely be they are the president of the small company. You have an impact on your clients who have children who are hopefully going to be investing in the right way for their financial future. And finally, you have yourself in your own family and the people who work for you. I was recently in a large organization that um, is, 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 is in the, the accounting industry, and I was surprised to find out they do not have target date funds in their portfolios for their employees. Again, I wanted to go for the neck, but I just know that whoever sold them what they got uh, didn't want them probably to get into target date funds. Because once you get into target date funds, you realize you don't need a lot of fancy advisors. My life is about writing articles at marketwatch.com. I'm a regular columnist there, doing a podcast every week, answering questions, doing all that I can to help people do better in their financial lives. I hope you will put me to the, tr to, to the test to see whether uh, when the rubber meets the road, we are really there to try to help. I appreciate your time. I do hope you will share this information with others. And go see twofundsforlife.com. And I think you'll feel as impressed with Chris Pedersen as I am. Thank you.